Hi, today we're going to talk about in this video module the five stages of growth that every company goes through as it matures and gets bigger. What you're going to learn in this video is how and what must shift in a company as it grows. Now, each of these stages and each of these gear shifts has its own checklist and much more detailed and elaborate things, and we're going to do separate videos on each gear shift, but this will give you the overall context, kind of the 5,000 or 10,000 foot view of the things to be aware of. Some of these are things you don't know you don't know that have to change as an organization grows. How the management style has to change, how the systems have to change, and, and how you uh, adjust many, many things in the business. Many businesses will reach a certain level and go sideways for a long, long time because the founders or the managers take the proof of their small scale success and use that as an excuse or a reason to keep doing things the same way. And the reality is you have to change at certain stages of a company as it grows and adds additional levels of people and management and scale. So, you know, everyone understands that a startup company is enormously different than an IBM. But we don't have a standard for how many stages there are. And that's one of the reasons I founded this business, is we don't even have a language, because some of the recommendations that come in books and authors and experts are watered down for the mass market. And they could be great advice for stage three and deadly advice for stage one, or vice versa. So anytime you're reading a book, you know, whether it's about marketing or management or leadership, you've got to think how does that apply to your stage of the business because the philosophies and the systems and the time frames and so many things are different. The, the VP of marketing job at IBM is a very different job than the VP of marketing at a startup. And if you were to take that IBM VP and put them in a startup, they'd fail. And if you would take that startup VP and put them in IBM, they would probably fail too because the jobs are, are so very different. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story about uh, a company that shall remain nameless where I was hired as uh, an interim CEO to come in and adjust that company. And what I found is this company was part of an incubator. And what I found is that the, the company was acting as a big company, even though it was a small company. And this prevented it from being successful. This was sort of a restart. The company had, had invested and spent uh, $4 million of a $5 million venture capital investment already the day I showed up. And it turned out had spent a little more than that. And they basically had paid a $30,000 fee to find me as an interim CEO to a headhunter, even though I had sent my resume to one of the partners there. So they were in such a mode of doing things in a big company way that it was wasting a lot of time and a lot of money. I was interviewed by an HR person. And, you know, not only was that sort of insulting, but there was nothing that person could ever do to validate my skills as a CEO because they were an HR person. They didn't have the skills themselves. And you got to realize you can't recognize skills and interview for skills that you yourself don't have. So on the day I started, they made me an offer. We worked through the contract and, and whatever. And the day I started, I sat down with the same HR person and she handed me a form and said, here's the form we have to fill out to hire someone and it requires five signatures. Well, I immediately took that and ripped it in half and handed it back to her and said, now it only requires one signature to hire someone, and that's mine. So this company had actually, it was a spinoff. Some of the people had come from a big company, a big computer company that was no longer around, and they had adopted many of the policies and procedures that had come from that big company. And that's the worst possible thing you could ever do in a startup. So I spent the next five or six months making very significant changes, not only in the company, but also trying to encourage a lot of change in the incubator as a whole to get away from those big company practices and processes that are very slow and lumbering and completely inappropriate. 
And the other thing that contributed to them having this big company style and attitude was they were also investing in biotech. And when you're investing in biotech, it's almost like a big company because you might spend 10, 20, 30 million dollars in research over five years before you have a product. And so that's obviously very different than an IT company, which this was, that needs to launch and have a product in you know, six to 18 months of a development cycle. And so you know, we made a lot of changes. But that's one of the reasons that I decided to start this company was I realized how few people knew how to shift gears from a small company, a startup mode, to the next phase and the next phase. And so we've developed this model to help create a, a smooth transition through these five stages of company growth so that you have a reference of what you should be doing when in this development of your company. So first, let's define a small business. The SBA, Small Business Administration, defines a small company as under 100 employees, a medium company as 100 to 1,000, and then over 1,000 as a large company. Well, it turns out that definition, most people don't know it in the first place, but in the second place, it's very impractical because all five of these shifts have to happen in that one to 50 or one to 100 company, 100 person employees. Um, so, it, you know, we don't want to use the term small business in the way the, uh, the Small Business Administration does because all of these gear shifts have to happen. The first one happens at about seven people, the second one happens at about 15 people, and the third one going into a stage four is, you know, depending on the business, it's going to vary between 30 employees and 50 employees. And so those stages of development, and we'll show you a diagram of that momentarily, you know, is really what we're talking about, understanding and having a context for when those changes have to happen. Generally, larger companies got that way by doing a decent job of figuring these things out, but most of them did it painstakingly by trial and error over many, many years. You can't start as a mature company, and as a matter of fact, you know, in the 1990s, when a lot of companies were getting easy funding for the internet, they often took big company executives like vice presidents from Sun and dropped them into a startup. And what they did was not birth the baby. They didn't go through the pregnancy and the figuring out and the iteration. They built what they were used to having at their big company because they had a lot of money and they thought they knew what they needed. But the reality is any new company has a lot of learning going through that birthing product, process of a new product and a launch into the marketplace. So you can't take big company people and put them in a startup and expect them to be successful any more than you could do the opposite. Big company systems are usually way too much overhead for startups. They don't adjust quickly enough. They don't take advantage of speed. They don't have you know, what are called the skunk works philosophies for rapid product development and testing and learning. And a, and a startup company is in the business of trying things and failing rapidly and cheaply until it figures out what works and homes in on the right thing. So all of these principles will apply and can be used in any business because when you're doing intrapreneurship, what happens is you're going to have a lot of new product development using the small company principles, even though the company as a whole might be using um, big company or medium-sized company principles. So a, a good metaphor here is think about the job of a captain during this cabin cruiser or small yacht versus the job of the captain that's running that aircraft carrier. You can't have those people change places and expect that to work and be smooth. It took many, many years of learning and having all kinds of different management levels, specialization of people, the org chart, the job descriptions, all the things that are coordinating on this ship that might have 5,000 people on it. Very different job, even though we both call them captain. Same thing for any title you want to put on almost anyone unless they're an individual contributor that's very specialized, a professional doing a very narrow thing, when you're in management, the shift in company size is a really big deal. So we're going to drill down now and, and talk about how each of these, you know, here's a, here's a chart that shows the evolution. And if we can think of a startup as a small speedboat, 
you can launch quickly, you can change direction quickly, you don't need a lot of planning, you're very fast. That's a good metaphor for a startup. But as soon as you launch and you have customers, what we call stage two, the early revenue stage, you suddenly have customers you have to support. And changing your product gets a little harder because of those legacy issues with your customers and your old customers. Once you get to stage three, when you've really refined your model, you have your profit plan down, hopefully you've documented your systems, your processes, um, you've, you've formed a culture and a brand that start to change, it starts to change less rapidly. So that's a stage three company. Stage four is what I call normally the rapid growth stage. And at that point, it takes more time and planning. You're stretching the planning horizons, the amount of capital you're risking and raising, all kinds of things that we'll list shortly for, for that stage. And we don't talk at airtight management much about mature companies because we're all about making these shifts here. And once you get to here, things get easier. You can afford to make mistakes. You've established yourself. You've worked out most of the processes and systems and what a job description is, who can do it, all those things that are risky in the early stages of a business.